more than 30 years as a police officer, including his years as chief of police in North Miami Beach. The family of Robert and Rose Stahl has generously provided these lectures available to our campus. Uh, and previous Stahl lectures have included Gilbert King, Janet Reno, Florida Supreme Court Justice Fred Lewis, Gary Neusner, and Mary Adkins. Representing the Stahl family tonight is Larry Stahl, Robert and Rose's son. Larry, can you be recognized? Larry, are you there? Stand up, please. Many of you know Larry uh, as president of the Florida Southern Alumni Association. So say hello to Larry tonight, and particularly if you're alums, and uh, I just want to thank you publicly. It's been a lot, a lot of years, and I really appreciate all your support for our, for our series. We have another great program tonight. Uh, before we get to our program tonight, which is going to be great, I want to introduce tonight's, spe uh, before I introduce tonight's special guest, I want to say a few things about our upcoming programs. Next month, uh, uh, on November 17th, we'll welcome David Powell, the author of the new book, 90 Miles and a Lifetime Away, Memories of Early Cuban Exiles, a book that illuminates a pivotal period in the context of the Cold War through the lives of Cuban refugees who fled Castro's Cuba in the early 1960s. Beginning again after the first of the year, in January, we'll be having three more great programs so stay in touch, and also we'll be having most likely some add-ons from that list as well. So if you're joining us for the first time, welcome and grab a brochure and give myself or my secretary your contact information and we'll get you on our list for upcoming events. As a lawyer, entrepreneur, and professor, Raymond Vickers has a long history of studying and understanding the economic ebb and flow of Florida's and the world's financial systems. Vickers served as assistant comptroller of Florida for four years. He represented over 100 financial institutions, including community, regional, Wall Street, and international banks. His business has also included global maritime industries and pursuits, both as counsel and as a principal. In the 1980s, Vickers decided to pursue a PhD in history, in American history, from Florida State University. That's where our paths crossed, sort of, because we worked under the same mentor at Florida State, William W. Rogers, who many in this room know, the late William W. Rogers. At that time, Vic had a thriving law practice that included global clients, and in other words, not your traditional struggling graduate student. The subject of his doctoral research was Florida's banking crash of 1926, a pivotal national catastrophe connected to the Florida land boom of the 1920s that contributed to the New York stock market crash of 1929. Vickers' book, Panic and Paradise, is the product of long-term research and successful lawsuits designed to force the disclosure of sealed records, which were under lock and key for nearly 70 years. Panic in Paradise is one of the best books published on Florida history in the last 40 years. Vickers' study is a cautionary tale of massive insider abuse, a conscious conspiracy to defraud, all behind a veil of regula regulatory secrecy. Currently, Vickers is the entrepreneur in residence and director of the Institute for the Prevention of Financial Fraud at the College of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Florida State. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Raymond Vickers to our stage. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I remember, um, I'm delighted to see John Wood here and his fiance. And I'm, uh, this is a very uh, important city. Uh, you know, you've, you've had, um, Two, two great men that I knew, uh, Senator Lawton Childs and uh, Charlie Kennedy, uh, the great man. Uh, Charlie Kennedy was, was the chief of staff for Senator Childs, and I was assistant controller when he was chief of staff to Senator Childs. So if we had a problem, we could call Charlie, and he would get it done that day. 
I mean, not just take your phone call. He would solve the problem. And it, he's the, uh, I think, the greatest public servant uh, that I've ever worked with uh, uh, as a staff member. He's unbelievable. Of course, his son went on to be Chief Justice of Florida. And so, and, and, and uh, Frank, the Frank Lloyd Wright uh, uh, inspiration in this college is really uh, um, impressive and um, something that uh, I know all of you cherish. Well, what we're talking about tonight is uh, the great Florida land boom of the 1920s. But we're also going to talk about, we got to talk, we got to talk about the elephant in the room. We've got to talk about fake news becoming fake history. And that's really what, ha what has happened. And uh, I wrote, you know, I s spent years and years, as Mike knows, trying to research this book. I had the national records, which are uh, uh, bank records after a bank fails, a, uh, you have to wait 50 years to look at the records. Uh, the interesting thing about 2008 is that the, I don't know if you guys knew this, the banks did not fail. Yeah, right. They, they failed, but they got bailed out. So the records are secret in perpetuity. You know, at least we get to see Jackie Kennedy's dress in 2103, which is still locked up. But the banking records will never be released unless there's an act of Congress to release them. And you can imagine why the bankers don't want their records released. I think Herbert Hoover in 1932 made uh, probably uh, uh, an argument that is still, still made, and that is, it, it's kind of like the idiot theory of democracy. If, if all of you and all of us, if Americans, this is what Herbert Hoover said, knew the true condition of the nation's banks, they would panic. Well, that, that's not very reassuring, you know, and uh, you could still say that about what happened in 2008, which was, you know, was a devastating impact. And why what we're gonna talk about tonight's relevant is because the records are secret. You know, the, the Wall Street uh, blew up the global economy in 2008 secretly. And some of us out there struggling, uh, small business people, uh, we didn't see it coming. I, you know, I've written a couple of books about that. I didn't see it coming either. And so suddenly we learned that the banks had sold more than 600 trillion, that's with a T, uh, face value of derivatives, you know, insurance products, if you will, uh, 600 trillion. Well, the problem is, and I, then I'll get into my, uh, might as well rattle the cage a little bit. The problem is that none of our presidents, no administration did anything about what happened leading up to 2008. So the banks kept selling derivatives. Anytime they wanted a profit, you know, you sell derivatives. And so uh, uh, George W. Bush didn't do anything. Uh, Barack Obama didn't do anything. Uh, surprise, uh, you know, Trump didn't do anything. And, and our current president, Biden, has not done anything. And so their derivatives have gone from 600 trillion, they're now at 1.2 quadrillion. So strap yourself in, you know. And so, you know, yeah, let's get in a war in Ukraine. That's brilliant too. Okay, so let's talk about what happened in the 1920s. I couldn't get the records of the state banks, even though we knew they were sitting in the state archives. And so we, you know, we were filing, threatening to file lawsuits. We were lobbying the legislature to uh, release the records. It was six, when I started my research, it was 63 years after the banks had failed. So why are the banks not, uh, your records not available? And so, you know, a lot of times when you get, when you, it's hard to sue, you know, uh, you know, what do they always say? It's hard to, hard to sue uh, the government, and so it's hard to, uh, uh, you know, we were doing all that, and we were not, you know, uh, getting the release of the records. The Florida Bankers Association, I hope there are no bankers here, but maybe there should, you know, 
it should be, to hear this, they were against the release of the records. And so, uh, so I wrote an article. Sometimes publicity, you know, uh, will do more than lawsuits. Normally it does more than lawsuits. And so I wrote this article trying to get these records released in the Wall Street Journal in 1989. And I was trying to rattle the cage. And I was talking about, uh, I was quoting Herbert Hoover, and the fact that, you know, we always think of the 1920s as the roaring 20s, right? That, that, that implies that it was good prosperity and all that. Well, guess what? 5,500 banks failed during the 1920s. So what did Herbert Hoover say about that? He said that the banks did not fail because of, uh, of, of uh, anything except uh, the economy. There was a downturn in the economy. Uh, a lot of banks failed in Florida. Uh, Ernest, I love his name, Ernest Amos, the controller of Florida, uh, one of a, a, a long line of corrupt controllers that we've had. Ernest Amos said that the bankers were splendid businessmen. Well, what I was trying to point out in, um, with this article was, if you got the, the other one, there you go. I said, I just had a sentence in there which said in Florida, I said that the currently federal bank records are kept confidential for 50 years after, uh, after an insolvency. In Florida, state bank records remain secret indefinitely. And that one sentence, uh, the, you know, the uh, St. Pete Times, uh, Miami Herald, a lot, a lot of major um, newspapers picked up on that one sentence and, and made it a cause celeb. Uh, Dr. Rogers, uh, who Mike was talking about, the wonderful William Warden Rogers, uh, and, and also Dr. Keichel, uh, major professor, great man. Uh, we went over to the legislature and, you know, with this in hand, lobbied the legislature and passed a law saying that uh, after 50 years, the records are public. And so I was able to get, the, get uh, copies of the records. And when I got into the records, what I found was that in each and every bank failure, the banks failed because of massive insider abuse and the F word that the bankers won't use, fraud. And so there's massive fraud. And, and uh, so, okay, it took a lot of work to get the records. I wrote the book. I thought that people were going to say, hey, that's a great book and all that. That's not what happened. When I wrote the book, the Florida Bankers Association, remember I'd been assistant controller of Florida, and we had had a few, um, uh, uh, you know, a few fights when I was in, in the government uh, because I was pushing a banking in the sunshine law in 1975, if you can believe that. And the idea was to release bank examination reports so we could actually see what, what was going on inside these banks because if a borrower defaults on a loan and gets sued, you know, for, uh, uh, it gets foreclosed on, then that, that's all public. And so why not release the records about, you know, the, the bad loans you had? They were very much opposed to that. So when my book came out and said that the, the banking crisis or the, the boom busted because of the banking crisis and that the banks failed because of fraud, then the bankers uh, hired a, uh, uh, a, a, this happened to me a couple of times with this book, the bankers hired a, an econ economic uh, professor at the University of Florida uh, and a, uh, also a history professor, and they wrote a book attacking my book. Now, you know, we spend years writing these books and nobody reads them. You know, I had a hard time getting my mother to read it, but you know, so you, you, you know, when somebody attacks you, that's the best thing that could happen. You know, great, maybe we'll get some publicity, maybe we'll, maybe we'll, get, uh, maybe we'll sell a few books, maybe we'll raise the, the, uh, the subject matter. So they wrote this book, and it's called like the Florida Land Boom, and all they did was attack me and say that I was wrong about fraud and all that. So then they came up with three reasons why 
the boom busted in 1926. Their first reason was, and they, they, they thought they really had it. They said, well, the Mediterranean fruit fly, now you got around here, you probably know about the Mediterranean fruit fly. You know, the Mediterranean fruit fly, this is what this book says, uh, that was attacking my book. It, it attacked the, uh, uh, the orange trees and everything of central Florida. And as a consequence of, you know, the banks couldn't get their loans repaid and they went belly up, and, and that's the reason that the, um, uh, the banks failed. Well, of course, they had no records. It was just a theory that they had come up with. And then it turns out that the Mediterranean fruit fly did attack, uh, but, but, it, but it attacked in 1929. Of course, the banks failed in 19, June of 1926. So you can, okay, that one didn't work. Okay, what, what did they come up with next? The, well, then they came up with a very uh, interesting theory. Well, I was totally wrong, you know. Of course, they didn't look at the records. They said, okay, and that's what history is all about, the records. We tell our students, uh, and, and I know Mike tells his students that do your papers, but don't, please don't cite any other uh, historian or don't cite any articles, just read primary source materials and tell us what you think they say. Because don't, we don't want to hear from some other historian or whoever, journalist. Look at the documents and then tell us what you think the documents say. So these guys came up with enough, they had no documents. So they came up with another theory. Now remember now, 1920s was a, was a period of prohibition, right? That was a great idea they came up with during the 1920s and so <clears throat> which of course made, uh, you know, uh, made, made people like uh, some, of, uh, some of the gangsters more than they did the bankers. But, but they came up with this idea that, uh, you know, that th there was some, uh, because of prohibition, the Coast Guard became very effective and it stopped the rum runners who were coming in from the Bahamas and Cuba and everywhere and because they were so effective because of prohibition, the bank suffered a, a liquidity crisis and the liquidity crisis for the lack of rum money caused the banks to fail. Well, I said, that's interesting. You know, if that's true, that really is interesting. So I went back and th they would have, you know, a paper they gave to a historical society. They would have a speech they gave, a lecture they gave. And when you go through the whole thing, you finally get to the end of it, and there's nothing there. There was no documents, none. You would think that they would at least have, you know, Coast Guard documents, right? Something, uh, they had nothing. So then they came up with a third, a third reason why I was wrong about pan Panic in Paradise and banks failing because of fraud. Banks fail because of fraud. That's why they fail. The good banks don't fail. The third reason was, it was the hurricane. You know, they had me on that one, right? 1926, we had this massive hurricane, 150 miles an hour, slams into Miami, goes across the, goes across the peninsula, very similar, right? It's kind of doing the same thing that, uh, we, that just happened. And so, it was the hurricane that made the banks fail, right? They figured it out. Well, the hurricane hit in September of 1926. I think it was September 18th, as a matter of fact. And the banks failed June 29th of 1926 before the hurricane hit. So <clears throat> that was interesting. So I go off and I'm, I'm giving a, uh, gonna give a, a talk you know, to the University of Colorado at Boulder, and I, it was this uh, international organization of economic historians, and you know, I thought I was really gonna be well received, right? So I go in and I start giving my talk, and I'm just attacked. The chairman just starts attacking me. And so the whole thing is very contentious, and we, you know, we go for like an hour, you know, he's basically screaming at me, and he was saying, I'm a bank historian. So after the thing, which was a little bit troubling, 
after the thing, he said, he, his, his theory was, no, no, this guy named Swiker. He said, no, 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 the banks, the banks, you're, you're trying to say that, uh, use the word loot. You know, you're, you're obsessed with the word loot. And of course, I would say, what would you like me to use? Uh, stealing, is that, is that, is that work for you? No, 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 you keep saying loot. They looted, they didn't loot the banks. And the banks just failed because of a downturn in the economy. And then, and then, he, then he says, uh, besides, the, you're trying to compare the, the ethics of the 1920s you know, to what happened uh, in the 1980s and 90s. And uh, that's, that was a false comparison, blah, blah, blah. So after it was all over with, uh, this very nice historian, a lady, came up to me and she pulled me off the side and said, uh, uh, would you like to have lunch? And I said, it's gonna be a liquid lunch. And I, and I said, yes. So, so I did all this preparation. I thought it was gonna be, they were gonna love me and all that. And, and so we got lunch and she, she apologized and told me that they had been, she had, was the co-author and that she was from California. They had written a book uh, called uh, The History of the California Bankers Association and they had been paid fifty thousand dollars, and um, she got twenty five thousand. And she said he's just, you know, the guy's, you know, very uh, 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 defensive, I guess. And I said, well, that's interesting. So we had a nice lunch, but that's what you run into. You, you, you. It's very difficult to find a, uh, you know, a a history of a bank or Wall Street that hadn't been paid for by, uh, by the bankers. And Dr. Rogers, our friend, uh, spent years writing a, um, I'll just say it, you know, I uh, guess I can't get sued for saying it if it's true, right? Uh, Capital City Bank. He was gonna write a history of Capital City Bank. He was a social historian. He was not an economic historian. He got the records, got the minutes, and after spending five years, and his manuscript's about a thousand pages long, they then seized the manuscript. And uh, Dr. Rogers was not paid $50,000. I don't know if he was paid anything, but he didn't, he, he f didn't know that they could seize you know, the, uh, uh, the manuscript. So that's what happens in these things. All right, so, so then after the book came out, um, I had one historian defend me. Well, I had a couple, but one locally in Florida, and he's sitting right over there, by the way. And uh, so we, we had this article. You got the article. Uh, this is an article about what I've just talked about. And so, but Mike, I appreciate you, you know, defending uh, the truth, and uh, that's a good thing. Okay, the Florida land boom, so we're trying to figure out what happened to the Florida land boom? We had this tremendous boom, and we've seen this in Florida a lot, right? It, it, we have booms and buses. So we had this big boom in 1925. And so to try to figure out um, who was involved and in, you know, in, in how, why, it, why the whole thing blew up, and, and of course I was looking at banking records, uh, but I get this knock on the door, and it, it, I had a, uh, uh, you know, a, a cabin down Lake Jackson, and I get this knock on the door, and, uh, and it's Dr. Rogers. And uh, I thought he was coming over to drink some bourbon, and uh, of course we did that too, but he, he, he said, I, he said, I got J.R. Anthony. I said, what? He said, I've got J.R. Anthony in my trunk. I said, what? So I go out to his car, and he's got all of J.R. Anthony's documents, everything, diaries, uh, uh, spreadsheets, everything. J.R. Anthony was a uh, very prominent, uh, he owned clothing stores in, uh, in South Florida, Palm Beach. He also was a banker and he was a partner with Addison Meisner. So it's one thing to look at banking records, but when you're looking at just documents, you know, it's, it, how do you, where's the story? So these records that the Anthony family gave to Florida State. Unfortunately, after my book came out, they came back and got them, and nobody else has access to them, but I at least looked at them and wrote about them and studied them 
for several years before the book came out. And so it, it, it told us a lot about what was going on in Palm Beach and with Addison Meisner uh, in, uh, in 1925-26. You want to show us, uh, now who is Addison Meister? I mean, why am I talking about Addison Meister? Well, he was the most flamboyant, um, you know, promoter in paradise, paradise being Florida, in the 1920s. But it, he, it was more than that. Addison Meisner was a fortune hunter. And he went to great extremes to become rich. And before Florida came along, he had never achieved you know, his goal of becoming super rich. And he went, in terms of extremes, he went to the, is, has anybody heard of the Klondike Gold Rush? Well, you know, we had, there have been three, three gold rush, two gold rushes and one land rush. We had the 1849 uh, you know, gold rush, around Sutter's Mill, San Francisco, Sacramento, the mountains there. And then we had the 1898 gold rush. Then we had the Florida uh, land rush or land boom. Meisner was in two of them, uh, Addison Meisner and his brother, Wilson Meisner. They were, they were in the 1898 gold, uh, gold rush in the Klondike. And that, but they didn't like it. So you got the... Uh, uh, what have you got? Show us what they had to do. Uh, have you got that for the Klondike? Has anybody ever been to the Yukon Territory? Probably some of you have been to Alaska, you know, on cruises and things. Uh, I've, got, I've got a house up in Anchorage. I love it up there. But if you're going to go to the Klondike Gold Rush, this is what you had to do. They lived in San Francisco, so they went up to uh, Seattle, as you can see. And then you had to go by boat all the way up to um, Skagway. But once you got to Skagway, and you see the Yukon River up there, and the Yukon River comes down. Uh, St. Michael's is a, a village that we're involved in. We're doing, a, we're doing a, a, a port up in St. Lawrence Island. But you see the Yukon River comes down, and then there's the uh, Klondike River, and that's where Dawson City is the confluence of the, of the Klondike and the uh, Yukon River. So these guys go up, they get to Skagway, have you got the Chilkooch Pass? And then they had to do this. Now the Meister brothers didn't like this. You know. And the Royal Canadian Mounted Police came up with a great idea. That is, if you, you had to take a ton of, uh, of uh, goods into Canada. See, on one side you got Alaska, the other side is Canada. So you had to go up this, this Chilkooch Pass with a ton of goods. So of course the misers were hiring people to carry their goods up and all that stuff. And so they didn't like this, it was cold. And so, but where they were headed, show us, the, uh, show us what they were after. They were headed to get gold. And you've got, I, went, I followed them all the way to Dawson City and there are a lot of records on the misers Addison Meiser uh, and all those, his brother Wilson in Dawson City. But that, this is what they were after. But in 1897, you would find uh, gold like this in the Klondike River, but then as time passed, you know, it would be mined out. But this is what they were after. You could understand the gold. And then show us a guy trying to get the gold. So look at this guy, this poor guy. This is what most people did. Look at him. He doesn't, he doesn't have any gloves on. He, I'm sure he didn't have any long johns on. That water's about 38 degrees. That's the Klondike River. And uh, got a nice beard, but uh, that's not going to keep him warm. So they would go out and they would, they would um, you know, try to get gold. And people were working really hard, thousands, tens of thousands of people. But, but so the Meisner brothers, Addison Meisner and Wilson Meisner, who end up in Palm Beach, you know, 20 years later, 25 years later, they formed a partnership uh, in Dawson City, and it's documented in the records of Dawson City, the clerk's office, they formed, and also the Historical Society. They formed a partnership with, with some nice people. You got a picture of their partners? There they are. These are the Meisner Brothers partners. And this is the University of Washington Libraries, and it says, a group of hard workers 
in Dawson City. Now, I don't know what they did, and I'm not going to get into that. And, uh, but I know what the misers were doing, and they were trying to steal money from that poor miner and everybody else that he was hooked up with. So this is who they were. And so, okay, you know, it's kind of like when you're doing an investigation and you see one document and it changes your opinion of somebody. But it was a hard, you know, it's kind of like a salmon swimming upstream. It's, it's really very difficult to criticize Addison Meisner. It's difficult to criticize Addison Meisner. And one historian, a, a guy that wrote a good book, but it was about Meisner's architecture. Meisner was an architect. And have you got his quote? And this is pretty typical of uh, what people have written about Addison Meisner. Have you got the quote from um, Donald Curl? There he goes. He's, a, he was a, he's dead now, unfortunately. But he, and he was a good historian, but he was, not, he was not an economic historian or banking historian, but he was a, he was from an architectural standpoint. And he wrote a good book about Miser's architecture. I'm not gonna talk about his architecture. And uh, he said that Addison Miser was just completely outgoing, true, and basically a really good guy, false. And so half of that is right. And so Miser, even though his company bank went bankrupt and you know millions of dollars was lost and disappeared, Meister still has this bigger than life um, reputation. Now my book came out and you know people still talk about like this and then they'll at the end of their talk they might say uh, well you know if you want to learn more about Meister's banking uh, activities uh, you know look at uh, Panic in Paradise but and I appreciate that you know okay but and and but a lot of things have been named after Addison Meister and I'm not, a, you know, I, that's okay. I'm all about, I'm not about tearing down statutes and changing names. I'm about, you know, let's learn about who, you know, our founders were. Let's learn about who uh, people in history were. And so a good example of that when it comes to Addison Meisner in Boca Raton, South Florida, is the Addison Meisner Elementary School. So, you know, you'd name an elementary school after a great man, right? Have you got that? This is very short. So here we go, Addison Meisner. At Addison Meisner Elementary School in Boca Raton, teachers strive to educate students and to assist them in realizing their full potential as responsible, productive, contributing members of society. These educational professionals provide an environment in which students are challenged. Excellence is expected, and differences are valued. We like to go above and beyond and do those enrichment activities. Sure, you can read about the immigrant experience in a textbook. But All right, that's enough of that. Okay, so that's fine that, that there's an elementary school named after Addison Meisner, but it would be nice if at least the teachers knew a little bit more about Addison Meisner. So who was Addison Meisner? Well, Addison Meisner, has anybody ever heard of Bernie Madoff? Have you guys heard of Bernie Madoff? He was the Bernie Madoff of the 1920s. Show us a picture of Bernie, there he is. Look how, look how happy they are. You know, he was at a charity event. Of course, he had stole, uh, stolen a billion dollars of their money, but he gave a little bit back to charity and he looked, you know, he looked like he was a very generous guy. He would have never got, he died in jail, of course. He would have never been busted except his two kids ratted him out. One committed suicide, unfortunately. The other one just died of cancer. You can't blame that on, on ratting his dad out. But the FBI and the uh, uh, SEC had uh, a dozen complaints on, uh, on this guy and they did nothing. And so, he, of course, he ended up uh, stealing about $60 billion. That's who Addison Meisner was. He was a thief. He was a con man. And so he, he was also an architect. So he, he forms this uh, company called the Meisner Development Corporation. And, and he was, the other thing he was good at, of course, he'd gone to the Klondike. 
he, had, he had, it didn't work out, it's too cold for him. He uh, didn't make any money. Went to Australia, became a boxer. He wasn't a very good boxer, so he, he quit that. And he ends up in New York and he becomes a, an architect. Didn't have any training, but he, you know, he had a, a great imagination. And, uh, and, and he had a tremendous ego and he was a great promoter. And so he forms and he could draw. That, that was the key with Meisner. He could draw. So he drew out two, two drawings, and then he convinced T. Coleman DuPont, a United States Senator from DuPont, uh, I mean, you know, the DuPont family, to become, he's also president of the DuPont company, to be his partner, T. Coleman DuPont. And he got to DuPont because he was close to a guy named Paris Singer. You know, the singer, that's an interesting story in itself. But this is DuPont. If you got Singer, there's Singer. Um, so, so in New York, Meisner got close to Singer. And Singer wanted to build a, it was 1918, he wanted to build a convalescent home during World War I. And so they were going to do that. So they go to Palm Beach and they, they start off, uh, you know, they, they built the, uh, uh, the war ended on them before the Everglades Club it becomes the Everglades Club was finished. You got the Everglades Club. So that's a, you know, the very nice club. And, and so, this was, so this was a way for Meisner to attract uh, you know, the, the society of Palm Beach. And so he, he comes up with these two drawings. One drawing was his house. So show us his house. This was going to be his house. Look at this. So this was, good, this was going to be called Castle Meisner and with a, with a functioning drawbridge. You have to have a functioning drawbridge. And this was going to be in Lake Boca Raton, which was south of Palm Beach. And so this was, so he took this to T. Coleman DuPont, but he also, took, he also because he could draw, he also he took a, a, a plat that he, that he made up. You got the plat? Look at this. So, so he convinced T. Coleman DuPont and some other people, uh, you know, there were a lot of people involved in this thing. The Vanderbilts were involved, a lot of different people were involved. So they ended up buying two miles of oceanfront and 16,000 acres, but it was just swampland. I mean, it hadn't been drained and they were gonna drain it because they were gonna put gondoliers and gondolas through it. They were gonna have 20 miles of, of uh, they, you take your yachts in and they were gonna do all this good stuff. But he could draw. He was really good at drawing, but he was a little, uh, kind of not real good on legal description. John, you know about legal descriptions. So these things didn't have legal descriptions, but they look good, you know, on a piece of paper. I had a partner one time, Amadeo Lopez Castro, he said, you can do anything with graphite and paper. So he comes up with this and he sells it. He's a tremendous promoter, and, but he had to, he had to, um, um, to, to get the word out and, and you know, really get uh, activity going, he, had, he formed a partnership with the owner of the Palm Beach Post. Have you got, his name was Donald Herbert Conkling, and he's in, he also was a banker, and he also was a real estate operator. Have you got a, a picture of, what do we got on the Palm Beach Post? Just a picture of the Post. But anyway, the, so he, this guy controlled he owned the Palm Beach Post, so anything that, so Miser started running full page ads, uh, there were full page, uh, you know, front page uh, stories about the development, and, uh, and, and so, uh, you, don't, you don't have that? No, we don't have that. Okay, all right. We not, do you have that thing on the Palm Beach Post? I don't think we have that either, do we? Oh, that's all right. So, uh, so okay, so they start, they start promoting. So. Show us uh, um, uh, Addison Meisner and his brother, Wilson, so you can see these guys. This is, yeah, this is, the, this is the pinnacle of their success. They were raising money, uh, a lot of publicity coming out of the Palm Beach Post. Uh, even the Washington Post, one of the top executives of the Washington Post, got involved, so they were getting good press out of the Washington Post. And so 
But the Palm Beach Post was the one that was generating, you know, this is the fake news becoming fake history. It's the one that was calling uh, Meisner a genius, calling the develop the most tremendous development that had ever taken place. And, uh, uh, and, and it all led up to, so Meisner came out and he said, well, we're gonna build a, uh, 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 do we have the Ritz Carlton? Yeah, we're gonna build a uh, 1,000 room Ritz Carlton on the ocean, 250 apartments. We're gonna have two polo fields, we're gonna have two golf courses, we're gonna have, a, uh, this is 1926, right? We're gonna have an airport, we're gonna have all these great things and uh, you know, marinas and all this. And, uh, uh, and, and so the Palm Beach Post was hyping it. And yeah, and so this was gonna be a great hotel. And then T. Coleman, do, it's so millions of dollars start coming in. You know, 21 million actually came in. And, <clears throat> but it wasn't enough, you know, because T. Coleman DuPont, a United States Senator had gotten his, um, hit one, somebody who's close to his lawyer, uh, Senator, uh, Congressman Graham, chairman of the House uh, Judiciary Committee, he had also joined this charade and so uh, Meisner, $21 million is a lot of money. 21 million flowed through, this is, you know, prior to the depression, there's a lot of money flowing through this thing on these lot sales. Of course, they didn't have proper, uh, you know, titles and all that stuff, details. And so Meisner just said, if you wanna buy a lot, just write a check out and send it to me. You don't even have to address it, just say Addison Meisner, you know, in Palm Beach. And so, T. Coleman DuPont, look at, have you got Wilson, that one picture of Wilson? Look at, this is, this is the treasurer of the Meisner Development Corporation. And the, you know, the chairman of the board was T. Coleman DuPont, which was a serious guy running the DuPont empire. And he did an investigation. In fact, he got the House Judiciary Committee to investigate this guy. Wilson Meisner, and they found out that he, you know, had gambling convictions and all kinds of stuff. And, and so they, T. Coleman DuPont went to Meisner and said, you've got to, you know, you got to fire your brother. I mean, this is crazy. And we got millions of dollars flowing through here. You got to fire him. And then they had a big blow up. And then um, the publicity hit. Meisner crossed the line. He started uh, saying that in, in the Palm Beach Post, take this ad which says that, uh, you know, we're going to have all these improvements, you know, 1,000 room hotel, 250 apartments, we're going to have, uh, uh, you know, gondoliers, we're going to have polo fields, and, and one third of all the uh, wealth of, of the United States are the partners, and they've, they've agreed to guarantee all this. So T. T Coleman DuPont said this is you're not gonna fire Wilson, I'm out of here. So he resigns, not in the Palm Beach Post, he resigns in the New York Times, he resigns Chicago Tribune, went nationwide, and, uh, uh, and so Meisner then had a cash flow problem. So he took the money that he had and he started buying up banks, and it's in the records. So the Meisner Development Corporation ends up controlling all these banks. And the wonderful thing that Meisner learned with a bank, and J.R. Anthony was involved in this, the wonderful thing is if you owned a bank, you had all this money, right? And so you could just, you could just walk in and, and sign this little thing, promissory note, and they would give you money. And so he ended up controlling a number of banks and uh, you know, throughout, after T. Coleman DuPont resigned, from, from November of 1925 until the whole thing blew up in July of 1926, they ended up controlling a, a lot of banks, and uh, you know, but, but you know, people were not stupid. You know, back then, a depositor did not have deposit insurance. That didn't come, come around until 1933. So people would hear rumors, you know, and they were, and, and once T. Coleman DuPont resigned, then people started uh, getting concerned, going to the banks, trying to get their money out, and then the one thing led to another, and then the whole thing just blew up. 
in June of, uh, of, of, of 1929. Have you got the picture of, uh, of that? So what did the federal government do? They knew this was going on. So what did the federalities do? They loaned money to the banks, the Meisner Bank, Palm Beach National Bank. They loaned money to it to try to keep it alive. And, uh, and, th and this happened. You know, and so in, 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 not in September when the hurricane hit, this happened in June, uh, June 29th of, of um, 1926. Uh, people panicked. They went to get their money and uh, the money was not there. And so, uh, you know, they, needless to say, it caused a panic. And once that, once, and, and then you had a situation where about 100, well, there were about 200 banks that were affiliated with Dawes, I mean, not Dawes, uh, affiliated with uh, Addison Meisner, and, uh, and, and most of them failed. One of the, the Atlanta partners committed suicide, uh, and the whole thing, much like 2008, except the bankers were, were bailed out in 2008, the whole thing came, you know, collapsing on top of, um, of Addison Meisner, and he, he uh, he, he took his, uh, 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 was forced to take his company, the Miser Development Corporation, into bankruptcy. You know, they'd gotten like $21 million. And the, the return on the, uh, for the creditors uh, was 0 0.0011, which in other words, if you invested $100 in this crazy thing, then you got one penny back. And, um, you know, but he never was indicted. Uh, he, uh, he died, you know, in 1933. Wilson went back to California. They, Wilson was, uh, you know, run the risk of indictment. Ernest Amos, the controller of Florida, was indicted. Um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the uh, depositors went after the controller because the controller did not, you know, regulate the banks. In fact, in the records, it shows that uh, J.R. Anthony and Addison Miser paid off the controller. What would happen is the controller of Florida, Ernest Amos, I love the name, would, uh, would, make a, uh, would grant a bank charter to these guys, and then he always wanted a loan, you know, and one particular loan I'm thinking of was $1,750. Well, that was a lot of money. You could buy a Model T for $290. So a loan, which he didn't pay back, of course, $1,750 for the controller of Florida. I mean, he, you know, if you could get that at each bank, uh, that was a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, bribe for him. And, but there, you know, that's why you've got to keep these records secret. Because can you imagine if we, uh, if the bank examination reports were public now, I mean, how many congressmen, you know, who knows? But I mean, you know, it's so, it's a, uh, but back then we could document that the controller of Florida plus his entire staff, each staff member uh, got loans. Uh, one guy got a loan of uh, some lower level guy, still examiner, got a loan of $500. Well, you know, $500 in 1925 was a lot of money. Especially when you could buy, you could buy uh, a Model T for $290. So $500 to a bank examiner was a, you know, was a, was a big deal. But again, all those records were confidential uh, for 63 years. We were able to get the records open. And as you can imagine, I could probably talk the rest of the evening, but I'm not gonna do it, Mike. So uh, I'll leave it there. Uh, so, so what happened to the, to the great Florida land boom? Well, when the banks panicked, as you can imagine, the fever, Busted, and um, and then the whole thing went like 2008 uh, collapsed. And uh, but it was not the Mediterranean fruit fly. It was not the hurricane. Uh, you know, it was not the rum less run being run. It was uh, massive fraud and uh, insider abuse. Mike, did you have any? Uh, you want to open up questions? I think what he's going to do is he's going to open it up for questions. Any, I'll open it up for questions. Any questions? Yes, sir.
Right. Well, the I don't know the particular. Did were they built? They were built. Yeah. Well, some of you know sometimes they didn't get paid. Uh, Addison Miser, you know, ended up building a, a hundred uh, room, uh, one hundred room structure, the Cloister Inn, and uh, and he had a big, you know, we saw a picture of them having a big dinner party. Well, they had rushed. Yeah, well, what I'm saying is a lot of them did get paid, did not get paid, and uh, we we can document that in the Meisner bankruptcy proceedings, like the guy that sent 902 uh, plates of china, he didn't, he got a, a penny out of every hundred dollars, he didn't get paid. Yeah, Mike. Well, I think I think that uh, I think what Mary, I'm driving at is everywhere all over. Well, the bust, yeah, the bust hit. When you had the panic of a, the banks, over 117 banks failed. What I was going to ask you is the, the set of all the records that you look at, how much, yep. how much, how many boxes were there that you actually were able to look at? What is, what is the size of the set? And did you just focus on Palm Beach? No, I looked at the entire. That quite a handful, like Doc Davis was actually in Tampa. Yeah. No, no, I looked at all of them, and, and, and it's uh, hundreds and hundreds of boxes. Uh, one time, uh, uh, my next book, Panic in, Panic in the Loop, about Chicago, when I went up to, uh, to Washington to, to do that research, the, the controller of the currencies office, their top guy, came out, and he says, oh, yeah, we know you, and uh, you're the one that said that... Uh, that the regulators and the bankers were barricaded behind a wall of secrecy. And we didn't like that. And I said, okay, it's true. I mean, I know you didn't like it. And so before we, the day was over, of course, I'm looking at uh, Charles Dawes on the wall, one of the guys writing about Henry Dawes. And uh, uh, so they ended up giving me an office and, uh, in, in Washington, D.C. and gave me a, you know, copy machine, you remember how important those things were back then, and uh, so I just sat there for a year and just blew copies, and that's it, you know, Panic in the Loop came out of that, but no, you've got to do the hard work, mm -hmm. I mean, it take, it'll take take you 10 years to, you know, you, it'll take you 10 years to write a book like this, because you've got to actually read, uh, you know, read the, uh, the records and go through them, and like I said, it, it's very difficult to... Um, uh, to know what the story is, mm -hmm. you know, and to get the color of and it. And then story out of those records, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, you... Thing that's looked, uh, so well, Matt, is it takes all these complicated banking records. Right. You know, uh, files and files of numbers, and obviously you've got manuscripts in there, too, uh, that you looked at. you got letters, you got letters well, going back and forth. All of this, all of this really, really complicated numerical... Uh, well, once you get in... Well, it's not as complicated as you think once you, you know, once you get into it and you try to, you know, basically if you can add, subtract, you know, you can <laughs> figure the thing out. And, but, it's, but, it's, but going through it, most historians, as you know, don't do that. They don't go through, you know, bank, I, it was not just the banking records. I had those. Historians run away from these kinds of stuff. They run away from yeah. Well, also I had the banking records, I, I had the uh, bankruptcy records, I had the litigation records. You know, I had a lot of different, a lot of different sort. I, of course, I had uh, probate records. You learn a lot in probate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and also, I had records like, uh, you know, you would run into letters and manuscripts. And of course, the uh, a big, uh, uh, you know, the J.R. Anthony. Yeah, I can't wait to talk papers. to you about that later on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was a, that wow. was a, a huge benefit.
Well, how would you like to meet the nephew uh, of Lawton Childs? This is Greg. How you doing? Good. You mentioned 112 banks had failed. How many of those? I, I'm sorry. You mentioned 112 banks had failed. Yeah. Was that all in Florida or was that across the country? Well, 117 banks failed in Florida. Over, okay. At that time, that how was, many banks were there in Florida? Do you know about? There were there were, there was about 200 banks that failed, uh, both in Florida and in Georgia, and they were connected. There was a. a an outfit uh, run by a guy named W.D. Manley, and there was a, a, an outfit run by, uh, um, th they had a number of people that were involved, and they were partners with, uh, you know, with uh, Addison Meisner. But and it, it, it's funny, because in the, in the 1980s, when I started practicing law, uh, it was the whole SNL thing, you know, and people wanted to come to Florida. And so I'd been in the government, so people started calling me, I couldn't even return phone calls. And uh, so we would have, you know, so we ended up representing like 100 banks, you know, and they wanted to come to Florida. I think I, uh, we also formed like 60, John, how many did we form? Uh, 60 banks. And uh, so uh, it, it, Florida has periodically, you know, had this, had this big boom. Thing, same thing happened in the 2000s, you know, in the lead up of 2008. So Florida was, was. But when they failed, the 112 in Florida, how many banks were left? Well, there was about, that was about, uh, there were, you know, uh, that's a good question. But it, there was probably, uh, that's probably a third, I think a third failed. Okay. And uh, I know from the, uh, they lost, uh, Florida lost a third of the deposits from 1926 to 1929. And it, it, in today's numbers, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, but we had like a, uh, you know, say a billion dollars worth of deposits and went down to 300 million, for example. And so two thirds of the money was lost. And uh, whether it, uh, you know, but, but they, you know, they quit paying out. I mean, that's what causes a, a panic when you don't pay and then you don't have any uh, uh, federal deposit insurance. So people do panic, and for good reason. You know, they panic, and uh, so a lot of people got hurt. And even like 2008, people don't really think about this, but we, you know, in the maritime industry, we've got a cargo terminal down in Miami and stevedoring and that kind of stuff. And what I tell my students, and it, you know, my I have an entrepreneur class, and I have white collar cr crime class, and people take both courses, but I tell them, you know, don't, don't mix it up. There's a line there, you know. And, uh, but what happened in, uh, in 2008 is that the banks got bailed out. Wall Street got bailed out. They were made whole. Jamie Dimon got him a new Falcon jet. He went from being bankrupt, you know, to a, a multi-billionaire. But the rest of us that had businesses uh, had to suffer through 2008, 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, it started coming back. 18, we were back. 19, we had a great year. 2020, we had the pandemic. Yeah, so, I mean, oh God. And uh, uh, so in the maritime industry, I never thought I would see where cruise lines were tied up at the dock in Miami. And so that was half of our business, $55 million worth of our business revenues was cruise lines. And so then, and then something crazy happened, and I don't know what happened, but I guess, I guess everybody was sitting on their couches, and we all had, you know, didn't, didn't want to go out and wear masks and all that. We, everybody sitting on their couches, they started ordering Amazon. And so everybody just sit there and order Amazon, and, and these packages were coming once a day. And uh, I think that's why Bezos owns, you know, the Washington Post, so he didn't get sued for antitrust activities. But so all this cargo comes in, and so even though we half of our we lost half our business, the cargo exploded, and uh, like we've never seen before, and it's still going on. So, I, but but the point was that it was very once the economy collapsed in 2008, once the economy in Florida collapsed in 1926, it took you know more than a decade you know, to get back. And of course, what happened back then, you had the stock market crash of 1929, and then you had the Great Depression. 
So Florida never got back until, you know, after World War, uh, World War II. World War II, you know, brought us out of the Depression. It wasn't all the programs, it was World War II and the, and the demands that were needed to uh, fund the war effort. Um, I, uh, I have to confess, I, I, I actually have uh, cited your book in my, my book about, uh, which is lar largely about 1926, but I haven't I'm read sorry. it. I'm sorry, what were you saying? I'm saying I, I've cited your book. Uh, oh, you cited In, 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 in my, my, my book about, which oh, is lar 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 largely about ni 1926. Okay. Um, but I haven't been able to read it because it was kind of hard to get. I did, but I picked up the, uh, the uh, two, two thirds deposit loss from uh, Google. And, and so I'm very excited about actually being able to buy it tonight and, <laughs> and, and read it. But I, you know, my contention in my book is that the summer of 26 is, is one of the more extraordinary times in the history of the state. And not just because of the uh, land boom, there was, right. it was arguably the most violent summer in the history of the state, like crime oh, really? was, was a, 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 and, and it was also, Essentially, the, the the peak of the Florida Ku, Ku Klux Klan's power of, oh, of yeah. the 20s, and all of those things came together at the same time, which is right. sort of what my, my what my book's about. I was curious, since I haven't read your book, if you had picked up some of that extra terror in, or or is your book still sort of well, I was looking specifically at, on 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 banking. Well, I was looking at crime too, but it was inside the boardrooms, <laughs> and so and uh, and uh, it's. Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 what you're talking about, of course, is that what was going on outside. And um, yeah, it's a, uh, the 1920s is a really interesting time period. And we, uh, you know, I always say that Florida is just, a, you know, a fa fascinating, maybe the most fascinating state in the country. And we have a history, but it's, a, it's good, bad, and ugly. I mean, it's just like any, any other history. And uh, the, the point is that, you know, let's, let's study our history. Let's study the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, uh, uh, but what you're talking about, it, that it was the 1920s were a difficult time, uh, you know, for crime, it's a difficult time of race relations. Um, you know, I, I was on a panel not too long ago with a, with a professor that was studying this and, uh, and he was telling me about, uh, uh, you know, the African American experience with with owning real estate and that kind of thing. And uh, I said it's worse than you think. You know, it's it's uh, uh, you know a lot of a lot of this land was, uh, you know, they did 20 acres and a mule, but if you had a lake, they would put the, you know, they put the 20 acres in the in the lake, right? You'd have just a few acres that wasn't in the lake. But uh, but then they. As time passed, you know, the, a, lot the, a lot of the African Americans lost their land. Some of them were indicted, and then, then they put the land up as security. Yep. And I'll just add at this point about prohibition. Yep. I mean, that's the core driver of, of both the, the crime and, and the racial uh, Oh, yeah. It's, it's the first trail of drug, 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 drug war. And, you know, it, it looks as if today it's just the, the, the same the, thing. Yeah, it's those damn rum runners. They were the ones that did it. But it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's same thing. The war on drugs. I mean, it's kind of like this. Uh, we got this insanity going on with a uh, regime change. You know, we go into Iraq, we go into Afghanistan, we go into Libya. I mean, now we're in Ukraine, and some of my general friends are telling me they want to, you know, do change the re regime in Moscow. And what I tell them is, well, let's not bankrupt the country and the world as you guys try to do that. And good luck on that, by the way. Napoleon didn't have too much luck on that, and neither did uh, Hitler. So good luck on all that. But please don't bankrupt, you know, uh, the United States of America in, in this crazy war that we've got going on right now. But, um, yeah, nobody likes to talk about that. But, of course, a lot of that stuff is secret. And... Uh, I always say the threat to to a democracy is the secrecy, you know, of our government and uh, our government's obsessed with secrecy. And you know, that that I believe is the biggest. You can't have a democracy without having, as James Madison said, without having information. And you got to get the information out there, and it's sometimes difficult to do. Any other uh, questions? I, I have a question. 
Yeah. Um, have you read Have you read Knowlton's book on Bubble in the Sun? I'm, I'm sorry. Knowlton's book on Bubble in the Sun. Have you read that? And uh, can you, Mike? I can't really understand what he's saying. Knowlton's book on Bubble in the Sun. Oh, Bubble in the Sun. Yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was very helpful in, in conjunction with what you were saying. No, I think he did a good job. He, uh, I think a lot of the, those books, uh, I think I may have reviewed that book, by the way. Um, it came out not too long ago, well, a few years ago, and I, I think I did review it. Uh, but yeah, it was a good book. It uh, was, it did get into you know the banking records and that kind of stuff, but I mean, it did a good job on talking about what happened. Yes, yes, sir. I, I'm curious. Uh, we, we know a lot of the money went to Tallahassee to the uh, to the bank examiners on loans that didn't get repaid that were right. diverted out of the 21. Bribes. Yeah. Were, were you able to uh, track down where other funds got diverted to? Uh, where, where other? Where did the rest of the 21 million dollars go to? Well, that's a really good question. Yeah, that's a great question, right? Now we do know that. Um, it, it, you know, I would have overrun the time period, but I mean, the uh, the Dawes brothers came in, and this is what got me into the second book, you know, the Panic in, Panic in the Loop. The Daw uh, Charles Dawes was vice president of the United States. He was also a banker, and his brother was controller of the currency. And so they swooped in and bought all the, uh, uh, all the unsecured no, all the, all the uh, uh, free and clear property that Meisner had. So they had like 87 acres on the water, and they, had, you know, they bought a bunch, and then they bought these contracts, uh, about $10.5 million, $10 million worth of contracts. Now, how much money they ended up getting out of those contracts, who knows? But so the Dawes Brothers ended, ended up uh, out of Chicago making, you know, making the money off it. Uh, 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 Addison Meisner didn't make him. He went belly up, and Donald Cockling, the owner of the Palm Beach Post, he went belly up. I think J.R. Anthony survived, but uh, uh, you know, like I said, the indictment of uh, Ernest Amos, the controller, they didn't know about the bribes. You know, that was secret. And of course, I, I, we found it when we got into it. But the, but they uh, people were outraged. He hadn't regulated, so they indicted him. He appealed it to. Um, See if this sounds familiar. He appealed it to the Supreme Court of Florida, <clears throat> and he was a good old boy, you know, panhandle guy. And so they reversed it and said, you can't indict a sitting controller because he's elected statewide. You know, you can only impeach him. And, uh, and, and, and one, one lawyer out of, uh, a guy named Watson out of Tampa filed impeachment resolutions against him and that kind of thing. But he had gotten so much bad publicity by 1932, he did get defeated. And we had, a, it's kind of a parallel to another controller that was in office about 20 years, same kind of deal, but you know, impeachment resolutions filed against him and that kind of thing. Controller used to be a really powerful position in Florida. It had been formed, I think, like in 1858 uh, Constitution. And, um, and we can't, you know, when General Milligan uh, I helped him get elected in 1994, defeated the incumbent controller. And then at the end of eight years, he abolished his position. And I was talking to him the other day. And I said, well, the problem with that is that now nobody knows anything about banking, right? Because if it's not an elected, yes, we had a lot of scandals and that was bad, but we, you could get publicity. Now you got this chief fiscal office. It's got, uh, you know, the treasurers in there. Uh, insurance commissioner and banker, but nobody knows what's going on. The records are still secret. So, uh, so I almost think that uh, a great reform might be kind of like the Public Service Commission. Well, okay, it, there was corruption when it was elected, so make it appointed. And then about 10 years later, maybe we make it elected again, you know, and uh, maybe we can find out what's going on. But uh, a lot of these government reforms don't turn out like you think they're going to turn out. Thank you, Vic. That was great. Mike, appreciate thank it. you. I appreciate it. Yeah. And um, would you come out and sign a book or two, maybe? Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah, great. Thanks. Right. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's great to be here. You know, the uh, Lawton Childs, Charlie Kennedy, and 
Chief Justice Kennedy and uh, Representative John Wood. And uh, it, you got a great history here. And this, uh, this is a wonderful college, you know, uh, liberal arts. And of course, you got Frank Lord Wright all over the place. And uh, so it's really a delight to be here. So thank you for coming. And uh, uh, I guess we're going to sign some books or something. Okay, good. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys.